you. Um, thank you to the college for putting this together. I think it's just a, a really good um, couple of days coming up. So um, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about really what NATA, who NATA are and really what we do in our, in our role in the program. Um, so I would just like to acknowledge um, traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So firstly, um, who are NATA? So you can see we are 75 years old this year, 2022, and you may have seen, you may have heard this already, but I like the story, so I'll say it again. So NATA was um, born out of some embarrassing failures during World War II. So there were munitions made in capital cities around Australia, and when they came to bring all those munitions together, it didn't actually fit. So there were bullets that didn't fit the guns they were made for and guns which didn't fit together. So that was a little embarrassing for the, for the um, Department of Defence. So they decided that probably we needed to do something about it. So um, a group of scientists and manufacturers got together and they thought that uh, Australia needed a more robust and reliable testing infrastructure. So um, this idea caught on and the Commonwealth, State and Territory governments collaborated and they established NATA um, as the national body to recognise competent testing laboratories. So that's where we came from. Um, we've moved a long way, obviously, since then, but you may have seen this sign. It's everywhere on social media. Our social team are loving putting 75 years out there. So um, We do have a, um, we are recognised by the Commonwealth Government in a MOU as the National Authority for Laboratory Accreditation. Uh, we are the first accreditation body in the world um, so um, that's very exciting for Australia and we are so recognised by the Commonwealth as, as the national accreditation body. Um, this is just uh, um, to make you feel better as lab people. We are actually a member of the International Laboratory Accreditation Corporation or ILAC um, and we, um, we put together a mutual re recognition agreement. So. Accreditation bodies around the world recognise each other and, and testing can be recognised um, in different economies. It doesn't have to be retested in Australia or in different economies. And that's probably more um, useful for manufacturing, um, you know, products coming into Australia or import, export food and wine. So Australian wine doesn't need to be retested when it gets to France. Um, I think there are some, um, some sort of um, analogies for pathology as well. Um, obviously, genetic testing now gets sent all, over, all around the world, and Australian results can be recognised by overseas economies. Um, obviously, during COVID, um, you had to get a test to leave the country um, to some countries, and uh, many countries required uh, NADA RCPA accreditation to actually um, um, recognise that test. And that NADA are part of the MRA, and the pathology program is part of the MRA. So just to make you feel better, we are assessed ourselves. There is an international standard for accreditation bodies, which is ISO 17011. Unfortunately, our assessment comes up next year, so Jill and I are working feverishly to make sure we're okay. Um, we have five days full assessment um, with seven assessors from five countries, come, and it's my peers, so I'll, we, we'll be assessed by my peer from Taiwan this year, um, which is pretty tough, so I'm a bit worried, but anyway, I know her quite well. Um, so, you know, um, it is full on assessment. We They come and look at um, in, our in-office procedures, the same as we do for you. They look at all our procedures, our corrective actions, all of the records of technical assessors, all of the records of our um, um, advisory committees. They look at assessment reports um, and then they go actually go out on site as well. They, so they witness as another assessment. So if you're being assessed around March time, you may be asked if you'll <laughs> you're happy for our NADA assessor um, evaluators to come in. They're not assessing you, they're assessing our assessment of you. <laughs> so um, that's that's pretty scary. I haven't had to do one, but um, it's pretty scary apparently. Um, so yeah, look, it, it's pretty full on. And we do get a, an assessment report um, the same way you do. We do get non-conformances as well, and we have to respond to those non-conformances. Um, and our assessment is the same time as our cousins in New Zealand, and they keep telling us they got non, no non-conformances last year, and we did. So they're very proud of that. Um, and we have to respond to those non-conformances exactly the same way you do. And then we get our accreditation we need the same way you do. Um, and accreditation bodies do get suspended from the ILAC MRA, and that's, I'm hoping that's not me because I still need a job anyway. So NITRA in general has, um, we have about four and a half thousand sites uh, worldwide that 
countrywide and, and overseas as well. This is NAFTA in general. And it's a really diverse sort of area, uh, areas of testing that we accredit. Many of them I didn't actually know we accredited. So cement works and food and waters and um, animal health, NDT, provincial testing programs. So um, RCPA, QIP accredited by NAFTA. Um, reference materials, a whole gamut of different testing. And you might see vans going past with an NASA logo on that. I've seen a few and people didn't even know we accredited those. But anyway, so, so it's a, a wide range of tests um, of, of sort of industries that we accredit. And in my patch, legal and clinical services, we have about 1,200 sites um, accredited. Obviously, the biggest program is the uh, NADA RCPA pathology program, around 700 sites. Our sleep disorders program is 10 years old this year, and that's in association with the Australasian Sleep Association. Uh, our imaging program is in association with RASCA. Then we have all our forensic labs, so our policing agencies and non-policing agencies. And our newest program is biobanking. And Jill's running an actually happy to talk to you for hours about biobanking. Um, and we had a 100% increase this year in our accreditation from zero to one. So. Our first biobank is accredited, and there's about there's only about ten biobanks accredited worldwide, so it's a bit of a first. I think there were only three by the time we got ours accredited, so that's that's quite good. So that's our newest program. So as Laurie said, um, the program's 40 years old this year. Um, it, it did come about from concern to the Commonwealth government about, um, I guess, the quality of testing. Um, the date I have is 1986 when it was um, when it was actually linked to Medicare. So we need to check our dates, I think. Um, so 1982, the program started linked to Medicare in 1986. That was a big driver. So um, I think the first accreditation was around uh, 1984. So it sort of sat there and slow burned, we call it, for a couple of years. And then 1986, so hundreds of labs who decided they needed accreditation all of a sudden, maybe because they wouldn't get paid tomorrow. So that um, so that was the, clearly the driver. Um, I think another key milestone was TGA's IVD regulations, in, um, which were enacted in 2010, and that meant that all uh, all labs doing in-house IVD, class one to threes, had to be NASA accredited, NASA RCPA accredited, in order to manufacture those IVDs. So that was another big driver, and that's brought in a lot of um, a lot of labs that we didn't even know were doing testing in universities and all those sort of places that were doing genetic testing, clearly in clinical genetic testing, who were um, under the radar. Then they, they were brought into the regulation, regulatory framework through the IVD framework. So I think that's that's proved very successful as well. So just the objectives originally uh, in 1982 um, to improve standards in pathology, um, to recognise um, those making uh, meeting minimal credit acceptable standards um, to encourage debate um, around appropriate standards, to heighten the awareness um, for education and training for staff, um, to progressively raise standards of pathology over time. And that's really what happens with a new program. It sort of starts off fairly low, and over time, uh, um, the standards increase um, in, in that sector. Um, but I guess number six is the most important, that to ensure that the public is better protected when we, when we um, identify a poorly performing lab, um, we can and do suspend accreditation. Uh, whilst we can't stop labs testing, that's that's not our role. Um, clearly not getting paid by Medicare is a big driver um, to not test. But labs, we have had labs who have been suspended, who weren't accessing Medicare, who continued to test for, for a time. Um, so they're, they're the sort of, the, I guess, the main drivers. I think they're still applicable to the program today. Um, and as Laurie said, I think it's been very successful in raising, raising standards of pathology over the past 40 years. Um, so what is the role? Just, just sort of the formal agreements we have. We have a deed of agreement with the Commonwealth. That's um, a tripartite with the Department of Health and Service Australia to provide accreditations, really for lab seeking Medicare rebates. Uh, that's a, a formal contract that we have with Medicare. And obviously we, the um, Medicare um, or the, the requirements of accreditation are to use the NPAC standards um, as, as described, and that's um, they're recognised in legislation. Uh, we provide a report to Service Australia after each assessment, and that allows laboratories to access their approved pathology laboratory status recognised by the Commonwealth to, to access Medicare payments. 
we have an MIU with TJ around the in-house IVD um, framework, um, which TJ recognised our accreditation um, in the in the um, uh, IVD regulations. So TGA don't need to do the work themselves. And we also have MOUs with all the states and territories uh, to provide in information regarding pathology testing. And that's really poor, poorly performing labs. So if we come across a poorly performing lab or a lab doing a poorly performing test, um, we are obligated to, to provide that information to the states and territory health departments. Um, and then how they act on that is up, up to them. Um, that includes public and private pathology, and it, and it includes lab, uh, labs outside of that, um, that state. So um, if a lab is performing testing in Perth on patients from Victoria, we have to um, advise both the Victorian and the WA state governments of that, of that um, poorly performing laboratory. So we see that as a key um, patient safety driver, those MOUs with the, with the state and territory government. Um, we also are um, under the deed are, are obligated to advise the Commonwealth as well. So Service Australia and Health about that poorly performing lab and TGA because it's an, if it's an in-house IVD. So there's quite a lot of reporting obligations on NASA if and when we find poorly performing labs. So the MOU, we have an MOU with RCPA, which Laurie just re-signed yesterday, so thanks Laurie. Um, and that really describes the um, organize, each organisation's responsibility in the accreditation process. So really NATA is responsible for the day-to-day -day administration, implementation of the accreditation process. We manage, um, manage the assessment, so we will be giving you um, emails and phone, phoning you up to see if you're available for assessments. We'll be liaising with the lab to find suitable dates when we can all meet together. Uh, we'll be getting the paperwork from the labs and sending that to you. Uh, we'll be uh, coordinating on the day the assessment process, um, making sure you as assessors have everything you need, um, re sending reports to the labs and, and, and um, acting on the, on the submissions if there are any to come back, um, liaising with you about issues or, or um, submissions that you're not happy with, um, potentially, um, maintain all the records of accreditation. Uh, all of these things are under our 17011 obligations as an accreditation body is what we have to do. Um, in addition to the assessment itself, we respond to all sorts of queries um, from outside, so from labs and pathologists and, and GPs and the general public. Um, and there's some very strange um, queries that we get sometimes. Um, and obviously communicate, formally communicating with the states and territories and the Commonwealth around um, assessment and activity when we need to. Um, another obligation under our accreditation is to form accreditation advisory committees, um, which I'll come to in a sec. So that's NADA's role is really to run the accreditation process, run the day, and then all subsequent accreditation uh, activity after that, maintain the accreditation, um, Liaise with Service Australia so labs can keep the Medicare um, Medicare APLs going. You as assessors um, do a wonderful job, so um, you can't thank you enough for the time you give up. We have around 900, a bit more than 900 assessors um, on our on our books from um, you know public and private um, pathology from all states and territories. Um, we have ART and um, IVF specialists, and we've actually got some TGA specialists as well to look at in-house validation um, of some assays. And I think that will become more important with companion diagnostics as we get more and more, more, and more of those coming through. Um, we have some nurses for our apheresis collections as well. I mean, it seems like a lot, uh, 400, uh, 900 assessors. But when you think that um, half of our assessor pool we can't use for half of our labs because private often don't accept private, some states don't accept anyone within that state, so WA won't accept an, anyone in WA won't accept an assessor from anyone in WA. So, we, uh, and there's other states so I won't go, go into those. So our assessor pool shrinks quite rapidly when you think think of that. Um, and obviously people are busy, so they can't do assessments. Um, so I think, as Laurie said, we're always looking for more assessors. So thank you for being here. But also, if you've got anyone else in your in your lab who wants to be an assessor, you think it'd be good please put their name forward, we really need them. Because 
Um, I mean, last year was an exceptionally busy year with, with um, sort of all of the COVID testing or accreditations that we did, but we used over 400 assessors last year. So that's already half of our pool um, gone. Um, uh, and we only like to use assessors once or twice a year. Um, so you can see that it's actually a real struggle to organise assessments, to find assessors um, for really um, all the time is, is difficult. So we're always looking for new assessors. We do have some criteria for being a, a technical assessor um, and really recognise professional qualification, a uh, minimum four years relevant um, laboratory experience, an understanding of the scientific quality and operational aspects of a lab. Now we don't need um, we don't need lab managers or um, directors of, of pathology to be assessors, they, um, because labs are all different. So we would like to take peers to peers. So a really good bench scientist can make a really good assessor, and we can take those to B labs, and, and you know that's that, that's a real peer sort of assessment process. So as long as they're um, you know, technically competent, we, we're happy to take them as assessors uh, and, and fit them to the various assessments that we do. We run an assessor development program, so this is complementary to the NASA uh, one day course that, that we run, and that's run in every state, um, every capital city, a um, couple of times a year for assessors. I think it's also an online component as well. So our development program is really about the assessment process, about um, you know, working with um, sorry, difficult people to get information from people who probably don't want to give you that information. So it's really about the, the assessment day itself. We're obviously not going to tell you, uh, we're not going to teach you the technical side because that's why you're here as technical experts. Um, and we'd like you to participate in at least one assessment a year if possible. And we know that sometimes is not possible. Um, so that, that's, a, um, that's something we would like. I think you probably should know before you do an assessment that you do get feedback. Every time you do an assessment, the lead assessor comes back and, and actually fills in a, a, a formal assessment of you uh, of your performance. Um, and again, that's something that we have to maintain as a part of our accreditation process. 99.9% um, .9 of the time it's great and there's no the feedback's good. Sometimes um, Jill or I do have to ring someone up and say didn't go so well last week um, and that can be awkward. but. Um, uh, we feel that you know any any negative feedback, um, we sh we need to pass that on on to you, um, and to, to maybe to improve the assessment process for you, um, and also know that every lab receives a questionnaire after each assessment uh, as well to say how did the assessment go, how were the assessment team were they uh, suitable uh, for your lab. So there are there is a, a feedback mechanism for you as assessors, um, and again. Um, if, if there is an issue with the assessment team, that is handled as a complaint in, in our system, and that's handled by our quality manager uh, who is independent of the assessment process. So hopefully I haven't put anyone off um, being an assessor. Okay, so the assessment team is always um, led by an ARSA lead assessor, and those who have done our assessments would know, um, would know them quite well by now. Um, just find my notes on this one. Um, so the NADA lead assessors, as I said, is to really um, manage the assessment day for you, to make sure you've got everything you need, um, to answer any questions you might have, to, to liaise with the lab and you, um, and, and if there's any sort of uh, conflicts on the day, to sort of try and manage those conflicts as well. Um, we organise the team hopefully appropriately, so we've got the right assessment teams together. Um, we write the report, um, we take your comments, we write the report, we code everything against the standards, so you don't need to know each clause of the standard. Um, your, your job really, um, um, the, the, the assessment will include one or many um, technical assessors, so sometimes we have, might have four assessors on the day, if it's a big category GX laboratory, you may have more than one lead assessor, if it's a, a very big um, assessment team. Um, and you're there as the expert, the technical expert. NADA staff are not technical experts. We are experts in quality management systems and running assessments, but we're not technical experts. We've all worked in labs before, but mine was at least 16 years ago, so I lose um, currency fairly quickly. Um, and as I said, the job you do is is is, is key. Without your um, 
input, we uh, it would fall over. The assessment process would not work. So giving your time up voluntarily is, is, is great. Um, but also the labs as well, who accept you in to, to labs. I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, it's a, it's a very um, collegiate process, that, um, the peer review process. Uh, they accept um, sort of outsiders into their lab, which is which is great. Um, and they give up um, employers, employees time as well. So they, you're doing it, um, you're doing the assessment voluntarily, but they're actually giving you up for the day as well. So that's a really mm -hmm. big thank you to the whole um, sort of, I think the whole process, and I think you know that collaboration works really well, and um, still works really well. Um, and I think the, the beauty of the, the the peer review assessment process is that sort of discussions on the day. I think um, you know knowledge is shared between the assessor and the lab, and and the lab and the assessor. So I, I think I did a few asses assessments. I was an assessor before I joined NADA, and you learn a lot um, every time you go out. I think you learn something. Um, I think that's the beauty of the peer review process. Just a bit about the um, accreditation advisory committee. You may um, you may hear our lead assessors say, "Well, we need to refer that to the AAC," and that comes through myself or Jill. Um, again, this is a requirement of our accreditation that we maintain these committees. Each area of accreditation has one, um, and really, the AAC is to provide technical support. Um, to us as NATA, I like said we're not technical experts, so we rely on the AAC to give up their time to provide technical support um, and admin support. Um, each AAC member um, is approved by the NATA board. The human pathology AAC comprises representatives of those all those um, professional bodies. There, the chair is always a fellow. Um, and the makeup is 50% of fellows of the of the um, of the HP AAC, and it covers all areas of of pathology. And um, I see Michael's here. Michael was chair of the AAC for probably felt like a lifetime. Michael didn't it? Really? <laughs> but you've got away now, so it's okay. And Laurie was on the AAC as well. So um, it's it's a really key committee for us um, to provide that technical advice. And um, so accreditation, when we have a new laboratory, um, I don't approve that accreditation, Jill doesn't approve it. It's actually a, 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 an independent process where the um, two members of the AAC will look at that recommendation, the chair plus the technical expert. So there's a, a haematology lab. So um, Helen Wordsworth is a haematology AAC member from, from SNP. She will look at that application and the chair and they'll decide whether that lab meets the accreditation requirements. Uh, once it's been through the uh, assessment team and they've said, yeah, we think we're happy with that, goes to the AAC for sign off, then comes back internally for, to NATA, and a senior manager within NATA will actually grant that accreditation based on the recommendation of the AAC. So once we've passed that on, um, the assessment team, the sector management have nothing to do with that accreditation. It's an independent um, decision. Um, every recommendation for a shortened reassessment or a follow up or a suspension also goes through the AAC. So again, that's not my decision or Jill's decision to suspend a lab that goes through the AAC. Um, and the AAC chair actually approves every single new technical assessor as well um, before it goes to the board. So um, Peter Stewart is the current chair. He will see every assessor that comes through and he does um, knock some back and say, I've read their CV, they don't meet the criteria. Uh, or they're asking for too much. I don't see that they can do haematology, for instance. Um, so again, that's another independent process to to get those um, viewers, technical assessors, on onto the onto the books, and then it goes to the NADA board for uh, that doesn't uh, go to the AAC. Um, sorry, the new um, new AAC members all go to the board. So just a few slides now on the risks. So we've talked about the risk-based process and. Um, you know, we've had a heavy focus on governance and risk in the last two years of our accreditation processes. We've brought in new assessment um, processes that, that focus on the designated person, and that's all to do with risk and governance. Um, and some areas of risk that are flags to us um, for, for labs as an accreditation body, um, the more complex the scope, uh, the higher the risk for the laboratory. Um, 
how the organisation is set up. So the number of number of sites they have, their geographical location. So they have multiple management systems within their organisation, and some still do. Um, not everyone is still, is, has the same management system. Um, the, the volume and frequency of tests. So infrequently performed tests is a high risk, um, a high risk sort of area. Um, key changes in their organisation. So company ownership. Company ownership, change of ownership can be a high risk. The, we often see new management, new owners come in, um, the existing staff aren't happy and the senior staff leave and that becomes a huge risk. Uh, a loss of key personnel, if you're in a category B lab with one or two people and that person who's been there 20 years leaves, that's all, always a high risk time for that laboratory. Um, the location, often the further you are away from the main lab, it becomes more risky. Um, change of equipment is always a high risk time and um, labs struggle with verification and validation still. Um, so change of equipment um, is, are all flags for us um, before we, you know, before we do the assessment. <laughs> the historical performance in, in obviously PT, QAP um, is a risk. Um, can a lab effectively clear their non-conformances? They may be very good at finding their own internal um, Internal um, audits might find, be good at finding their own non-conformances, but they actually don't clear them. They don't have time. Um, they don't know how to clear it. Um, cause analysis, do, do labs actually understand what cause analysis is? Do they look more deeply into those non-conformances that they find or that we find? Um, we find that cause analysis is often quite superficial. Um, you know, human error, and human error can be a reason, but, off, but sometimes it's much deeper than that and the lab doesn't go into any more detail than that. And of course, if you don't look for the cause, you're not going to address it appropriately and that issue is going to keep coming up. So history of sanctions. Um, unfortunately, there's a group of labs that bubble around the, the minimum mark and they sort of go over and sometimes above and sometimes below that line. So we see, you know, if a lab has a poor history, um, in, in suspensions or uh, requiring follow-up visits, that's a, a flag for us that this might be a, a, a risk, a risky laboratory. The competence and experience of lab personnel, we talked about losing senior staff. Um, you know, can lab, labs attract people with the appropriate qualifications? Are they employing people with the, with the appropriate experience for the scopes of testing? Uh, turnover, turnover of staff is always a, a sort of a risk or a flag for us that there might be something not quite um, not quite right within those laboratories. And the ratio of newly employed to experienced personnel, um, it's all, you know, this is all obviously to do with personnel, but again, that's a high risk. So if you've got lots of inexperienced staff and only uh, one person who is very experienced, that's that's a high risk for that laboratory as well. So again, um, our, our goal, and I don't know if Jill's going to talk about this tomorrow, is to, to eventually um, think about a risk profile for organisations. So put all of these all of these things together and um, come up with some criteria and actually have a, a risk profile to say this laboratory always performs well, they've got, um, they're, they're steady, um, it's a low risk laboratory and this one actually has lots of issues, it's a high risk laboratory. And eventually, potentially, we could tailor our assessment programs to the, to the risk of those laboratories. So uh, the, the higher the risk, we go more often, the lower the risk, we go, we go um, less often. That's a long term goal and that's going to try need a change in regulation, but that's ultimately where we want to head. So to actually really look at the risk profiles of those organisations. As assessors, these are our top five, top five findings. Um, this is based on data from last year, uh, but we did the same thing for 2019, I think, and we found the same thing. We did the same thing for our sleep program, our forensic program. These are the top five findings in every laboratory. Um, over well, decades, I think. Um, so QC, uh, unacceptable QC or QC not being reviewed or actioned appropriately, uh, non-enrolment, poor participation, poor performance in QAP, and more than that, no review or not no timely review uh, of, of QAP is, is something we find um, very often. Um, Staffing issues, training competence, um, not just records. Um, that's you know, uh, as a as a as a training record not been signed, that's of less importance than there's no training record. Or when we spoke to that person, they were never trained in the first place. 
um, training and competence are different things. So labs are good at training generally. Sometimes they're not really good at assessing the competence of that person afterwards. So competence um, is something we, we find fairly of, uh, often in a lab, that the lack of um, sort of an appropriate competency assessment of those staff. And often they assess once and then not again. Um, so, you know, again, that, that's an issue. Um, validation and verification always comes up. Um, as I said, that's a high risk, um, high risk area, new change of equipment. And I think ver verification mostly is, is poorly understood. Labs really don't know how much to do. Um, and we can't tell them. We're not a consultancy. So um, that's something, you know, just tell me how many I need to do and we'll do it. Well, we can't actually tell you that. You should know because you're the experts um, running that test. And, and, and linked to that, the equipment being shown as fit for purpose. Um, so again, validation, verification, um, lack of maintenance of those analyzers. Um, so you will find these when you do assessments and we've shown this to labs and, and it still keeps coming up. So if I was a lab, well, these are the first five things I'll concentrate on because I, I know as a lab, you're going to look at them as assessors and you're probably going to find things. So, um, so bear that in mind. But the good news is that um, labs are actually pretty good in Australia. Um, so 17% of assessments we did in, in 2021, and these are just these are reassessments. So, so with the technical assessor team, 70% actually zero findings and zero submissions, and 34% only had one submission required. So, you know, um, not significant findings. They could close those out very quickly. So that's within a month of the assessment being due. That's actually pretty good when you think of all the labs we did across COVID as well. Um, I think it's, it's actually a very, a very positive sign that yeah, Australian pathology is actually very good. Um, there are some that actually aren't so good and, and take sort of six months to, to a year to close out. Um, but I think those figures are, are, are really quite pleasing. Um, and just for the MPAC, um, MPAC standards, 50% of labs had no finding against the, the key document of MPAC, um, the RMPS. And 89% had no finding against the supervision document. Now, those of you who remember the pain from when it first came out, um, there were lots of issues with supervision, the designated person and scope of practice. I think in sort of three years, that's an amazing turnaround. Uh, nearly 90% of labs has absolutely no finding against supervision. So I think that's really good news. And that's my presentation. Thank you for your time.